Hey guys, and thank you for coming to the second part of our portfolio series. Um, before we kick off, we are going to have a short five minute talk from our sponsors, Wesleyan. Um, thank you guys so much for sponsoring us. We really appreciate it. Um, it will just be a short one and then I'll introduce our lecturer, Ben. Thank um, you so much um, for introducing me. Um, my name is Veronica and I'm one of the student liaison managers here at Wesleyan. Um, we're just here to have give you a quick five minute talk about what we can do and how we can help you. Just to let you know, all signups will receive a £10 Uber Eats voucher as well. And the QR code is on screen. We have gone green, so there are no paper more applications. Um, so do scan that QR code with your phone. It'll take you straight across to application form so it gets you ready um, for everything that I'm speaking about. So just a few things. Um, to let you know what we can do. So we can help you with sponsorship. We can help you with financial education. Do give us a follow on social media as well. If you have any questions about your elective, then do come to me as well. Um, we can do everything like that and cover the cost of your income protection, which is what I'm going to be talking to you about today. So just before we go into that, um, most of you will probably know what your earnings will be like as an F1. So just to recall it, it'll be about just over 28K. So you'll be taking home about 1.7K after tax and all of those other deductibles. But there are the possibilities of earning more money, such as doing on-call, weekend allowance, night duties, or working outside the EU working directive as well. So it's really important to think what would happen um, now that you know what your earnings look like, what would happen if they ever stopped and would you want them to stop? So just a quick video. At Wesleyan, we know that studying to be a doctor or dentist may be the most memorable experience of your life. But sometimes things don't go to plan. If you're hit by illness or injury, you can receive regular tax-free income to help cover your outgoings if you can't study. If you're a medical or dental student in your penultimate or final year of study, Wesleyan's Student Income Protection Plan is designed for you and it is completely free for students. You'll be covered for physical and mental health if you can't study for six weeks or more. We also offer free care and support services to help you get back on your feet. The protection also covers you if you're injured or playing sports. And it's worldwide take your income protection cover with you wherever your education takes you. We're the only organization to offer occupation specific income protection while you're studying. Wesleyan have been supporting medical and dental students and professionals as a mutual for over 180 years. You are at the heart of everything we do. There is nothing to lose. Apply today via the online application form for peace of mind from Wesleyan. So as that video showed, um, it should have hopefully given you a bit of an introduction to income protection and what it is to help you. Um, so just to let you know, when you do work for the NHS, um, the most that you'll be entitled to in the first year of working is one month's full pay, two months half pay, and then nothing at all. And it isn't after after six years of working that you receive the full benefit, which is six months full pay and then six months half pay. So it's really important um, especially as a student, for instance, um, you have no income at the moment. So if anything does happen to you, then you can rely on Wesley. And also as a junior doctor, it's really important because in the first year of working, if you do go for anything long term at all, and if COVID has taught us anything, then then what will happen is you'll have to dip into your savings. And unfortunately, usually as an F1, you probably don't have that many savings in place. So Wesleyan can be intact in for you in order to help you. So the way that it works, just really quickly, is uh, you'll be placed on phase one of the cover, which is absolutely free, as mentioned. And what happens if you ever become sick or injured for six weeks or more, we will pay you £210 per week until you're better. And, it can, and you can receive it for up to two years if necessary. As I said, it's completely free and it covers you for mental health, anxiety, sports injuries, absolutely anything. It just depends on your own personal bill of health at the time. What happens is you get it free for the whole of penultimate year, final year, and also the first couple of months of F1 just to get your feet on the ground. Then what happens is once the free cover has come to an end, it is then your decision whether or not you wish to continue with it. If you do wish to continue with it, then it is at the subsidized rate of £15 per month. But as mentioned, you don't have to take it out at this point. Um, you can just have it for the free period and just fill out that you have that safety net as a student. We hope you take it out as a junior doctor, but if you choose not to, that's absolutely fine. We tell you to discuss it with peers amongst you and other doctors. You'll be surprised how many people actually have income protection in place and how important it is kind of for your financial future, especially when you take out mortgages and other things like that. 
So what's covered? So just to run through this, so it covers you for HIV infection, it's elective for any, so occupation specific, covers you for dangerous sports, if you want to jump out of plane, we can cover you for that as well. And also for ladies, it covers pregnancy complications, and most importantly, any mental health conditions as well, stress, depression, anxiety. We don't have a list of things that say no, everything is a yes. It just depends on your personal bill of health at the time. So again, here is the QR code on screen. As mentioned before, you do get a £10 Uber Eats voucher as well when you do sign up with us. Um, we do have a deadline just to give you a little bit of urgency. Um, so it'll be until um, 10 a.m. tomorrow morning that you have the, um, the ability to apply. So obviously if you can do it today, that would be great. Um, and then I will send the Uber Eats voucher to you via email straight away afterwards. Um, and that is everything from me. If anyone does have any questions, then my email address should be on screen shortly, but I will also put it in the chat box for everyone as well as also the link also to the application form at the same time as well. Thank you so much for having me um, and hopefully you got a lot of information in a very short space of time. Thank you so much, Ronica. Um, yeah, just chuck both links into the into the chat um, for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, okay, if anyone but, has any questions, I'll be on the chat. Perfect, yes, anyone send questions her way if you have any. Um, so now on to our lecture guys. We, our lecturer today is Ben Murphy, who is back by popular demand. He um, did two of our lectures in our previous series and got very, very good feedback. So we brought him back to do um, our lecture today on portfolio for foundation, maximizing your portfolio for foundation doctors. Um, we hope you have, if you enjoy it. And if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A rather than the chat because we monitor it throughout and we'll answer it as we go. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to see whether or not Ben can share his screen. Um, so hi, uh, thanks for the introduction, Kate. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm currently doing an F3. Um, I am locuming in Yorkshire. Uh, so Kate, if you go to the next slide, and again, lovely. Um, so yeah, that's my plan for the year, Yorkshire locum. So going between Harrogate and St. James's. Um, we're going to squeeze in a few holidays and squeeze in a few triathlons. Um, my jobs in F1 and F2 are on the side. So I've done a mix of medicine, surgery um, and paediatrics. So next slide, please, Kate. Um, so we're going to go through um, sort of ARCP. Uh, with some tips about how to try and get the most out of your F1 and your F2 years with a view to doing a surgical career. Um, but I think the best thing that you can do is just uh, have a solid um, Horus profile. So we'll go through each of the sections in Horus, because I know when I started as an F1, I certainly didn't know what quite a lot of them were, and I left a few things towards the end. Um, so listed down the side, core procedures, supervised learning events, which we'll go through, and then the various, very others, various other bits and bobs. Uh, next slide, please. So ARCP stands for your annual review of competency progression. And it's something that as um, F1s and F2s will have to do um, twice. So once at the end of F1, which grants you your full registration, and then another one at the end of the, your F2 year, which is when you get free from the F1 and F2 years. Um, you'll then have to continue doing various other forms of um, competency progressions through being a doctor or surgeon. Next slide. So I thought we'd start with um, core procedures. I know for the current F1s, I think they've made them uh, not mandatory, so you don't have to do them, but I think they're still a good thing to do. Uh, one, just for your, your progression as a doctor and also to show enthusiasm with practical skills. Um, so 15 core procedures and where to find them. The ones that you'll come across most often are probably bloods, cannulas, ABGs, blood cultures and catheters, and that's male and female. Um, so have a look for them when you're on your wards and various rotations. If you can get into theatre, obviously more, more common on surgical jobs where you might have a bit more free time, say if the wards are quite well staffed, um, just discuss amongst yourselves and see if you can share free time to go into theatre. Your registrars and consultants will usually be really happy to have you there because um, they love enthusiastic doctors. Um, so theatre is probably a better place to try and do uh, local anaesthetic, um, catheters again and sometimes this is better because the patients might be unconscious so it makes it a bit easier if it's your first few catheters to get the grips with it. Um, airway care if you've got any anaesthetic placements and IV injections and then the nurses can be great help with the skills IV infusions and prescriptions they'll they can sign off for you it's anyone that's trained in that skill that can sign you off um, and blood transfusions again they'll do them quite frequently on the wards and then all types of injections, 
would used to be mandatory, but obviously if, if you can do, they're good to get. Um, your friendly F2s or uh, core cool surgical trainees or IMTs can help, you know, watch or sign you off if they think you're competent with ECGs and peak flows. And then airway care um, is easiest to get during either a crash call if you're allocated the airway, which I know is an F1 or F2 you can sometimes seem quite scary. Um, or during your ALS teaching, you can get signed off as well. Next slide, please. So my top tips for core procedures is to start early if you do want to get them all, because um, there's quite a lot to get through in a year. I know some of them are quite common. Um, things to think about, you can, you can lob them together. So if you're doing an ABG and the patient's quite upset about having one done, um, you could give some local anesthetic at the same time and get that signed off. If you're doing a cannula, you could give an IV flush or give some IV injection through that and the nurses can sign you off for that. Join the nurses on any meds rounds and generally they'll have, they'll have enough subcut ones to get a few of you signed off. And if you are doing catheters, often in patients in surgery, each trust will depend on their own guidelines, but sometimes they'll get IM antibiotics with catheter changes, especially if they've got um, if they've had a recent hip placement. So that can be a good point to get an IM injection done as well. Next slide, please. So um, ARCP say the assessors should be more senior than an F1, um, fully qualified, and if possible, get different assessors for each one. So basically anyone other than your F1 colleagues can get these signed off. Next slide. So the main, the main part of your HORUS, which will um, take most of your time when doing your portfolio, is your supervised learning events. So F2s, I mean, you'll definitely be aware of these, and F1s hopefully are starting to get to grips, but I thought we'd go through each one um, with just some tips about how to uh, get more or try and get them more towards surgery if possible. So aim to get 15 to 20 done over the year, um, and the point of this is to demonstrate a range of evidence for managing physical and mental health and a range of specialties. So there's three mini kecks, which is a clinical evaluation exercise, DOPS, where they, someone watches you do a practical procedure and a CBD case-based discussion. Next slide, please. So who can sign off your SLEs? Again, anyone competent in watching you doing what you're doing, but they have to be more senior than an F2. So unfortunately, F2s can't come with you, say to an acutely unwell patient and sign you off with a mini kex. It has to be, um, a core surgical trainee or IMT equivalent and above. And obviously your supervising consultants or GPs if you're in GP practices. And also to note, I think something that's not really known is that nurses and other allied health professionals can sign you off for these. So if, um, if you're with a senior nurse, one of the sisters on the ward on say a night shift and you're seeing an, an unwell patient or um, you're with a physio and seeing a patient, they can sign you off for a mini kex. Next slide, please. So you need to aim to get two or three mini kexes per placement, and that can be sort of subsidized, if you like, with a DOPS, um, a, a practical procedure. So you can do two mini kexes and one DOPS to make up your three in total. Or if you don't do any DOPS in that placement, you have to do three mini kex. And they advise that you do two CBDs per placement. And it's worth checking all of these numbers with your own deanery because some will have different rules. I imagine some hospitals are probably pushing to make clinical skills mandatory despite ARCP guidelines. And I know my hospital for F2 was really pushing to have um, CBDs, at least 50% of them signed off by a consultant, which could be quite difficult at times. So it's worth checking that. Next slide, please. So what can you do for a mini kex? Essentially, any interaction between you and a patient, ideally that's been watched, um, that you think you can learn from. So taking a history, examining a patient, uh, coming up with a diagnosis, uh, communicating difficult things to patients or relatives, or coming up with a discharge plan. Um, so the most common times that you'll come across these is if you're on a ward round with a consultant and they sort of let you take the lead with a patient. Uh, or let you examine, let you review. Make sure you're pushing them to, to get you signed off for mini kexes. Um, and if they do say at the start of the ward round, you know, is there anything you, that you'd like to, to get out of this? Just, just say, I'd, I'd really like the opportunity to be watched reviewing a patient and come out with a mini kex to sort of aid my learning. They'll appreciate that enthusiasm. Other good times um, is say if a registrar has had to come and help with an unwell patient that you're dealing with, 
say they've watched you do an A to E examination and they've sort of chatted with you about what your investigations and your management would be, uh, ask them for a mini Um, This is another one where perhaps nurses or allied health professionals could help. So a difficult conversation, if you're breaking bad news to a patient or their relatives, if you've had to have difficult conversations with relatives on the phone or in face-to-face, um, if something's happened with your colleagues and you've had to manage an awkward situation where, you know, someone's not sort of showing brass practice on the ward or you're worried about someone's professionalism and you've had to deal with it, uh, really anything that you can think of to prove that you're working on yourself as a doctor, basically. And these will be easier got in, in A&E, AMU, SAU, so surgical assessment unit or CAT clinic, like anywhere where you're assessing patients regularly. Um, with senior support is a good place to have them done. And ideally, you are meant to have been seen doing the review or the exam uh, by the senior that's signing you off. But often, if you discuss uh, a patient in depth with your reg or with a consultant, say you've seen them on ward round by yourself, um, often they're, they're quite good and will we'll offer to give you a mini kex if they're impressed with what you've done. So next slide, please. So DOPS, I think this is a good place to try and show your enthusiasm for surgery early on. Um, so any practical procedure, and obviously it's easier to get in some specialties than others. So in medical specialties um, or sort of day-to-day -day ward work, you could get an ABG signed off as a DOP. Um, even if you've used it as a clinical skill, there's nothing stopping you putting that as a DOP as well. Um, if you're on gastro, perhaps acidic taps and... Uh, commonly on you know elderly wards or uh, ng feeding tubes if you're on dermatology a skin biopsy although i can't say i've ever done or seen anyone do one and then sort of the various surgical specialties there'll be a range of things that you can get involved with as, as an f1 and f2 and i think it's easiest to get involved if you show you're enthusiastic for that specialty or just show your enthusiasm for surgery and, and getting hands-on registrars really appreciate that and they'll be much more likely to help you um, you know, get into theatre and assist them if, if they if you show that you're sort of enthusiastic and working hard in the specialty. Um, so, for example, when I was on orthopaedics on call, they'd often let me go and do the joint aspirations with them. Um, and if, you know, your on call clerking shifts weren't absolutely manic, then that was a good point to go to theatre. And in some trusts, you'll be put down as a sort of first go to theatre assistant. So even if you are busy clerking, you often get uh, taken to theatre for the emergency cases, uh, generally more as a F2 or SHO. Um, and in most surgical specialties, think of skills like suturing um, and rouse tubes. They're common things that can happen even on the ward level. Um, and in urology, you might have the chance to do uh, quite difficult catheters. I know in some trusts, they'll have sort of catheter clinics where a reg will be on hand to help, but it will mainly be the F1 or F2 going to do difficult catheters that uh, people need done in hospital and you might even get a chance to have a go at suprapubic catheters which is a really useful skill to know for on-call shifts um, and then obs and gynae obviously you'll be in the theatre quite a lot for deliveries and c-sections next slide please so the last of the supervised learning events are your case-based discussions um, and again, these are similar to a mini kex. So sometimes it's quite difficult to decide whether to do a mini kex or a CBD based off something you've done with a patient. Uh, often CBDs tend to be more uh, if you've just discussed something with a consultant or a reg rather than, uh, you know, hands on examining, reviewing, seeing unwell patients. Um, and they tend to focus on different aspects so your, your clinical assessment and how you've approached that and then discussing the rationale behind your investigations or referrals um, and sort of the risks and benefits behind them and what you're hoping to show. So, you know, there's no point doing an investigation if it's not going to change your management. So that's often quite a good one to talk about. Um, and then similar for treatments, the risks and benefits behind treatments for certain conditions, for different surgeries, different surgical approaches, whether they're going to do a uh, watch and wait or go in for surgery, like the difference between those two approaches. Um, follow up, whether, you know, when you've, where you've had to show compassion or empathy or difficult mental cases for you that you've been through that you've discussed with a consultant. Um, so yeah, my, my tip for this would just be be opportunistic. And I think 
more things than we realize can be put down as a case-based discussion if you've had a good chat with a registrar or consultant so don't be afraid to ask for one um so yeah just some examples down there that i think i've probably covered a complex case or a complex diagnosis um talking about sort of say the risks and benefits versus antibiotics or surgery um and then investigations for PE, sort of what scoring systems we use, what investigations we do, why would we do some rather than others? Um, or if you've been in surgery as a theatre assistant, you know, often the registrar will be happy to sort of take you aside afterwards and have a quick chat about what you've seen, um, you know, what approach they used, why they did that rather than something else. And, you know, talking about the surgery in general and what the outcomes are. Um, so yeah, CBD, 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 just ask and see if you can get one. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, yes, and this is one of the ones where consultants, um, sometimes trusts will say that you have to have, you know, a certain number signed off by a consultant. So ideally your clinical supervisor should be the one to be sitting down with you and managing these. I remember I, I had quite a lot of difficulties in one of my placements getting, um, case-based discussions and mini cases by consultants because on the ward rounds we were mostly doing junior-led ward rounds and rarely we'd have any senior cover to discuss with if I really know other than telephone advice and then when I this was on haematology when I was on the haematology center um again rarely would discuss with the consultants because we had such good like specialist clinical nursing team uh, and it got to the point where the sort of deanery actually had to contact our clinical supervisors to say like you know your your students aren't really getting anywhere with their portfolio so they had to book time out to sit down and we booked a slot for a cbd so if you're struggling just make sure you email your clinical supervisor and say you know if you are struggling to see consultants and discuss cases just set aside some time discuss with your consultant and choose a case that interests you um, and then you can sort of steer the, the CBD a bit better. Next slide, please. And reflections. This is one that I think a lot of people will leave till the end of the year. And I know quite a few friends that got too close to sign off time. And, you know, we, we were told we had to have 18 reflections in the bag ready to go. And I think they had to do eight in an evening. And they can be quite difficult to do. Um, if you're not doing them at the time, because you sort of run out of ideas of what to do. So I've put some ideas down here, but essentially top tip for this is to reflect separately on every supervised learning event that you do. So when you do, when you input a, a mini kex to Horace, you've probably seen there's a, a box at the bottom for reflection and it says, or you can reflect separately. So just put C separate reflection and then make a separate reflection form to put onto your portfolio and just label it, you know, reflection of mini kex unwell patient with abdo pain or something um, and then that just helps get your numbers up and essentially you can reflect on so many things so anything that has an impact on how has an impact on you or the way that you think or how you do your job something that's helped you um, you know decide that you want to do surgery like a surgery that's interested you and you think actually I really want to do TNO because I've had a really really good on-call shift and I've can really see how the registrars love their job and how the surgery is really interesting. Anything that um, you can think of really can go in a reflection. Um, so ideas down here. Um, mand so it's mandatory to reflect on any taster days that you take. Um, so the rules may have changed slightly, but I think we were allowed to take about between three to five taster days each year. Uh, and if you've not got say the jobs that you necessarily wanted or you've not got enough you don't think you've got enough experience in a surgical field that you're interested in applying to later on down the line taster days are a really really good opportunity to show that you've spent you know your free time and you've pushed for experience in a field um so your, your educational clinical supervisors for surgery or even just you know emailing uh, secretaries or consultants in the surgical department to say you're interested and to try and get some days there. So definitely reflect on your taste days um, and any training programme days. Um, so they're more common in F2. Um, each, each sort of deanery will have their own list of days that, that the F2s will take. But every single day that you go on, make sure that you do a reflection for just what you've learned or how it's changed how you act or 
you know, work at work. Other ideas, any difficult on-call shifts or times that you've struggled with time management, you could reflect and say how you've, um, you know, seen that in yourself that you weren't managing jobs very well or you weren't prioritizing well um, and how you're going to change that. You know, you're going to change how you order your referrals on your you know, piece of paper or phone um, and you're going to come up with a different system of prioritizing like color coding or, you know, I see lots of people in work with the pens that have about eight different colors around the side. And as the as something gets more urgent, the colors get more urgent and see big red crosses everywhere. Um, any complaints or significant incidents that you're involved in, which can seem quite scary at the time, but the work that we do, we're bound to get, um, you know, complaints or incidents happen, even if we aren't necessarily at fault. Um, but if you are involved in anything, make sure that you do a reflection on it, because that is mandatory to show that you've sort of taken on board any patient or relative issues with care that they've received in hospital. Um, and just worth noting that that doesn't necessarily stop or hinder your ARCP progress if you do get a complaint, uh, say, like quite close to your deadline, your, your school will phone you and, and sort of organise how that's managed. Um, more ideas, death of a patient or, you know, an unwell patient that deteriorated, you know, what you think could have gone differently if, was it a good death? Could have palliative care been involved? Were you happy that they were comfortable? Was it expected? Just things like that to get you thinking. Um, difficult conversations or breaking bad news to patients is a good one. How you think they reacted? How did you react? You know, did it take a heavy toll on you to have to be in that situation? Um, I think before I started F1 and F2, I thought that I won't possibly be breaking bad news or having, you know, really difficult conversations about stopping treatment or starting sort of end of life care pathways because I'm only an F1. But actually, I don't know whether you've at the stage yet, but I think you quickly realise that often you are the people to be going and doing that because you know the patients quite well if you're seeing them day in, day out on the ward. Um, you know, the relatives know you if you've been giving them updates on the phone. So often, if there's not senior cover to provide for it, you will be doing quite difficult conversations. And all of those seem quite negative. So if something went really well at work that you're proud of, um, make sure to reflect on that as well. Uh, so it's not all doom and gloom in the reflections. Next slide, please. Um, your tab team assessment of behavior, you just have to do one per year. And usually it's done at the end of the first placement. Um, and it's essentially just a screening tool by the deaneries to check for good professional behavior. Um, so be nice on your first placement to pass this. You need 10 forms back and it can be an absolute nightmare to try and harass people to fill out these forms for you. So I'd say send at least 15. If you can send more, send more. Um, and you need a range of assessors to show um, sort of breadth of, you know, screening, I guess. So doctors, nurses, other allied health professionals, ward clerks, secretaries, anyone on the ward that has seen you at work over the last few months, you can send a tab to. And I think different deaneries may have different rules, but you need a certain number of each to pass the tab. And one thing that I didn't realize is once you've sent your first tab off, there'll be a countdown clock. Um, I think it's something like 45 days, which is how long you have to get your tab completed. So I would probably start by gathering people's names and emails, maybe on a piece of paper first, just to see that you're starting to get enough and then, and then put them on in, in one bulk go. Otherwise you might find that you're scrabbling to get enough people before the timer. Um, and it's quite nice, um, you know, if you're if you're getting on OK at work and um, you get to read all the comments at the end, which are anonymized. And uh, it's quite nice to have some feedback on your work. You know, it, hopefully it's mostly good. And if it's not mostly good, it's it's nice to see anyway, to see um, how you might be able to improve at work, because I feel like we often don't get much in the way of feedback, which I think is why Horace is so heavy on. Uh, you know, discussing your next steps, even for a mini kex or a CBD, you'll need to show what you're thinking about to improve or what you're going to go and read about. Um, so yeah, that this is going to be quite nice. Next slide. And this is relatively new. I think when I was in F1 and F2, the placement supervision group wasn't mandatory. So often my 
educational and clinical supervisors didn't really know what it was or how to do it. So essentially it's also once a year, which is, you can do it for every placement, but you should do it ideally once per year. I think it has actually been made mandatory for you guys, new F1s. And it's for, it's kind of like a tab, but for more senior members of the team who interact with you regularly. Now, that can be, as you probably are finding out, that can be quite hard if consultants are changing regularly, um, if your rotor means that you're moving around different wards. Um, but to your clinical supervisor, you need to highlight between the two of you, Nate, they can, they can recommend people as well, highlight some um, either, you know, core surgical trainees or IMTs, registrars or consultants that you think you're going to be working closely with over the next couple of months. Um, and they fill out basically exactly the same form as a tab. And it's just another way for Horace to feel like they're giving you support at placement. Next slide. And this will be the bane of your life. Curriculum mapping is essentially showing that you've met all the criteria to be a doctor able to pass ARCP. So for us, we had, um, and I believe current F2s will have 20 curriculum points to map and they range through sort of four or five different categories. So they'll be prescribed safely, um, keeps patient at the center of care, uh, demonstrates that they can manage end of life symptoms, palliative care symptoms. Uh, you have to tick off things like career planning. You have to show that you can manage acutely unwell patients. Uh, show that you can review, assess, examine, come up with a differential and a management plan. And I think there's even ones like, you know, demonstrates awareness of long, long term conditions or something. So you just have to, for each mini kex you do, you can assign it to a curriculum. So say if you see an unwell patient and you um, cannulate them, you prescribe them some IV antibiotics and you discuss it with your registrar. If you try and get a mini CAX for that, you can map it to, I think you can map it to a maximum of, I think five points, but that might've changed. So you could map it to, you know, manages an unwell patient, prescribe safely, uh, you know, follows good practice when doing core procedures. So, you know, just start early and start trying to tick them off because otherwise you might find that when it gets to the end of the year, uh, if you've not ticked them all off, you, you sort of end up trying to, you know, make mini kexes or CBDs to highlight target areas that you've missed. Um, one thing that you can do if you're struggling is, is reflect on, on that, reflect on something that's happened related to that. So for example, if you've managed an end of life patient, but you didn't chat with a registrar or a consultant to get a mini kex or a CBD, you could reflect on it yourself, how you found managing that situation and then map that to the manager's end of life uh, symptoms criteria. But for you new F1s, they've made it 13 criteria instead of 20, but I don't think that necessarily is gonna be easier because I believe, I don't think they've come up with final numbers, but I think they want you to make sure you've mapped a variety of evidence to it. So for example, uh, you know, mini kexes, teaching hours so a lecture or and or reflection so I think you might have to map slightly more than we did for each criteria um and last tip about this is don't get caught out with the minimum number I think I ended up a week before my ARCP deadline for F2 thinking I'd finished everything and I got emailed to say that I only had one criteria mapped to something and I had to quickly make a reflection to map to it as well, to make sure I had two for every criteria. So just uh, keep an eye on that. Next slide, please. So your personal learning log um, is essentially just a diary of all the teaching that you've attended. Um, I think through, through COVID, ours essentially got scrapped and they said, don't worry about how much teaching you've had to attend because we didn't get any, they, they all just sort of got canceled. Um, the log is split into two sections. So you've got your core learning and your non-core learning. Core learning is anything that's delivered by the foundation school. Um, so your weekly F1 teaching or for F2s, your sort of your training days that you go on. Um, and you need 30 hours of that. And then you also need 30 hours of your non-core learning. And that's 
that's got um, exclusion criteria. So you can't include anything that's mandatory to attend. So say when you start a job, you have to go to induction. Um, even though you might be learning, you can't put that on your teaching log. Um, you can't put courses like ILS or ALS. And unfortunately, if you, you know, have some teaching on a ward round from the consultant, you can't put that on either or any conferences that you attend. But you can do any, you know, seminar teaching, tutorials, small group work, um, peer to peer teaching that you have in your department, any simulation sessions that your trust may run for you if you're lucky enough. Online learning you can do. I think they'll they put a max number of hours that you can achieve for online learning towards your hours. And I think for us, it was around about eight hours. Um, any grand rounds or ballot groups that you go to for psychiatry can also go on. Next slide, please. So I think teaching um, and your learning log is a really good time to try and shine in the portfolio because everyone will have to get mini kexes and CBDs to sort of get ticked off. But this is something that you can actually really try and push forwards and make something you know, of yourself and of your time at work. So I think the easiest place to start is your departmental teaching. Often departments won't have organized any teaching for the juniors at all. And if that's the case, I'd really recommend setting some up because it's quite a simple job. Essentially, you just need to arrange with the hospital a room that you can use each week or each fortnight. Come up with a rotor for the juniors if they're happy to be involved with peer to peer teaching um, and provide topic ideas. And, you, you know, you can always pair with a registrar or a consultant to help with that. Um, and you could also get the, you know, if you didn't want to just do it within the, your, you know, F1, F2 a uh, course surgical trainee level, you could, you know, go above that and see if the registrars are interested in getting involved. And that will look really good, not just on your portfolio, but when you come to apply for jobs, you can put that on your CV. Just make sure that if you are, if you are putting effort into setting something up like this, that you get a consultant to sign you off um, to show that you're putting the work in. And if you are interested in surgery, I'd try and see if you can set this up in one of your surgical blocks. Um, and then, you know, if, if you if you are setting something up, try and take ownership and pride in it and see if you can continue it even when you've moved off that rotation or, you know, even moved hospital. Um, I've, you know, I know friends that have set up, um, you know, teaching for med students or teaching within a department that they've sort of continued having uh, an input with, which looks really good. Um, and you can get inventive with this as well. Like even if you do have departmental teaching, um, I know some people that set up a suturing, uh, you know, how to basic suture course at the hospital and they had, they rented some of the um, equipment from the hospital and they had a reg come and help as well. And they, they taught, they taught people how to do sutures uh, and they got that signed off as, you know, setting up a teaching program. And another thing to mention is the developing the clinical teacher. Again, depending on how bad COVID gets, I think this may get made non-mandatory, but essentially you just need to show that you've, you know, ran a learning session. Uh, so I think for my F1, we were actually rotated to do teaching for the medical students and a registrar was there to watch. So it basically we were set up to do our developing clinical teacher. Um, and if you do set up teaching, peer-to-peer -peer teaching is a really good chance to get that signed off, but it would be really useful if you could get a registrar to come and sit in with you um, so they can sign off anyone that does want to get that signed off. And more on teaching, sorry, probably labouring this point a bit too much, but try and get feedback if you do any teaching sessions, even if it's, you know, a, a quick bedside teaching session to med students, um, or if, you know, you've, you've set up teaching or you have the opportunity to deliver teaching in an already organised departmental teaching, take feedback forms or, you know, a link to a feedback survey and just gather evidence for your teaching. And then if you get the chance to do that session again, you can show how you've taken that on board and how you've, you've changed your session or the way that you deliver it um, to try and make it, you know, a bit more uh, solid, solid on your applications. And what goes around comes around. If you're in theatre with a reg and they show you how to use uh, cameras, like offer them, email feedback you know can I send you an email about how great you've been teaching me this that and the other because then they can put it in their portfolios and they'll be much more likely to help you um, with yours next slide please and then 
just essentially be aware of all the forms that are hidden on Horus. If you've got an organized um, sort of ARCP person in your hospital, they'll they'll send you nonstop emails when it gets close to the time. But you need to meet with your clinical and educational supervisors. And I just try and combine them. So just do an end of placement and start of the next placement one for your educational supervisor, because otherwise you have to meet like six times through the year. Um, there's declarations that you have to sign off to say that you're honest and trustworthy, blah, blah, blah. And then at the end, there'll be form R, which essentially is how your attendance has been. So you need to keep track of any days that you have off through the year. And it's up to you to make sure that you've got that number accurate and what the reasons were for each day. So just keep a note if you do have any time off, for, you know, sickness or anything. Um, and any instance that you've been involved with, go on that form as well. Next slide, please. Bro. And then the other main place that I think you can make a difference in your portfolio um, is any audit and quality improvement work that you do. This is like your absolute chance to get close contacts in surgical departments that you've worked in um, or that you've, you know, introduced yourself to to try and do an audit with. Um, and, it, you know, you can actually start working closely with your seniors who are often leaders in their field. And if you do get involved with projects um, early on, it might be something that, you know, gets bigger and bigger and, and spans out over years. And if you've got your foot in the door early on, you know, this could lead the way to, uh, you know, posters at conferences, publications, um, which all looks really good when you're applying for jobs. And, you know, it just shows that you're interested and you're enthusiastic about surgery. And I would say if you're not on a surgical block early on and you're wanting to get started on an audit just contact any any rotations that you do have coming up later because you should have your clinical supervisors already uh, listed on Horus and their emails they won't mind at all if you just contact them and say you know I'm on medicine and A&E for the, my first two placements but I'm really interested in surgery could we meet earlier than the third placement to talk about you know any audit opportunities and I think that would really, uh, really, really help you guys when you're applying. Next slide, please. So just a sort of little example to finish with, because um, I know this, this material can be a bit dry and a horse isn't the most exciting lecture. Um, so this is from one of my other previous lectures. We won't go too much into the clinical details of it, but um, just look through this case and have a think about your supervised learning events and just think how you would approach this um, after the shift to see how you can bulk out your portfolio. So you're on call in hospital and you're bleeped to see a patient with abdo pain while you're on your general surgical rotation. He's 59 and he's just had a left hemicolectomy for cancer five days ago. And he's telling you he's got worsening abdo pain. If he feels unwell, he looks rubbish. His new score is feverish. He's tachypneic, he's tachycardic, he's got low blood pressure. So immediately you know that you're worried about this patient and you bleep your reg as you start your A to E management, and they helpfully arrive just as you're beginning your A to E. So they watch you assess this patient, and you come up with your management plan, um, which I've listed there. Now, I'm not saying that they stick around to watch you do all of these, and also I hope that you don't have to do all of these yourself when you're on call, because you'll be busy. But if the clinical support is off sick, and all the nurses claim that they can't do cannulas, um, then you end up cannulating, prescribing fluids, um, and starting a fluid chart and a catheter, giving antibiotics, taking blood cultures and bloods, and considering a chest X-ray. You discuss with your reg um, about having CT abdo pelvis and being taken to theatre. So next slide. So how many SLEs do you reckon you could try and get out of this? Um, I'll just open the chat box and that includes, actually, I won't give you that tip. How many do you think you could get? I'll just give you all another sort of 20, 30 seconds or so. And if no one's brave enough, we'll go through it.
unless I'm in the wrong chat. All of them. <laughs> if you played your cards right, but I think you'd struggle to get every single SLE signed off. All right, let's go next slide. So I reckon you could get at least eight. Um, so if you were unlucky enough to have to do all the skills yourself, you could get um, six skills signed off. Um, and then this would definitely lend itself more to a mini kex rather than a CBD, because obviously you've been involved with the patient and the registrar's seen you sort of manage them with an A to E um, review and starting your initial treatments. Um, and then obviously reflect separately on that as well. And if you're lucky, the reg is lovely and tells you that he's got an audit lined up for you as well. So you could start getting involved in audits. Brill. Next slide, please. I think that's that's my last one. So yeah, just to summarize, I think get started early um, on your portfolio because it saves you time later on and you, and you can show your enthusiasm quite easily. I think the best ways to sort of make yourself stand out from others would be to start trying to set up teaching, be that with your peers or with other medical students, not other medical students, your doctors, with medical students, um, and try and get involved in some audit work and quality improvement work early on. And that doesn't necessarily have to be, um, you know, asking, are there any audits? If you're on a surgical job and you think there's something that could be improved, come up with an idea for a quality improvement project yourself. Um, even if you think it's quite simple and just let your clinical supervisor know that you've had this idea and they can help you with any specifics without getting that set up. Um, and it, it really helps if you can show that you've come back to that work and sort of reevaluated any interventions that you've put in place. Um, so for example, I was still involved in an audit until recently at the LGI about sepsis in surgical patients. Um, so we sort of put interventions in place and, and re collected data about three times, uh, which, which just shows that you're sort of, you're keen and enthusiastic and, and have stuck to it. Um, so I'll take any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat box if they haven't been answered already. Um, and we'll, between us, see if we've got the answers. And it's worth mentioning that the next lecture will be on actually applying for core surgical training. Um, so if you think your question might relate more to that, hang on till next week and we'll have We'll have help available then. Thanks so much, Ben. It was such a good overview. I definitely learned some things that I can do better. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, please remember to do the feedback. As you know, it's um, really useful um, for Ben as well. Um, I'll check with Lois, see if there's any in the Q&A chat, um, any questions, and if not, chuck them in the chat or the Q&A, guys. Um, and yeah, next week we'll be on applying for CST, which will be covering kind of how to get the top points in the portfolio and um, also the CST interview as well. Um, it will be done by someone who came 38th out of about 2000 people who applied with help from uh, two other people who also, one, one of them who came eighth um, in the applications and uh, another one who I think was also up there. So. Yeah, some three very, very high achieving CST applicants who will be involved in that lecture. I'll just see. So I just found some in the Q&A that I've answered, but just for the benefit of everyone. Uh, yes, you can put today's session on your learning log as a non-core hour. So that's tick one extra one done. Um, and if you've already done a reflection on a CBD form, you can copy and paste that into a separate reflection. And often you'll find that the... If you do it on a separate reflection form, it will prompt you with a few more questions. It's, I think it's just one box if you're doing it on the actual mini kex. But if you say see separate reflection, it will ask you to fill out a few different boxes. So it may, it may be that you can copy and paste bits, but you might have to embellish some um, if there's bits that it's asking you for that you haven't addressed. Can you map your tab to? The curriculum yes you can map it as um you know if you get a comment in there that's like works really well with his colleagues or she's really good with uh, putting the patients first you can map that into your um curriculum parts that you know talk about putting the patient first or you know working well with in a multidisciplinary team or something yeah you can map that you can map anything that you can think of on horus usually you can map 
if you go to, you can map this, you can map your teaching. So put, put this on your Horus as an hour of non-core learning and then map it to your career planning section. And yeah, that's two things ticked off. Any more questions, guys? Oh, we're all good. Well, thank you so much again, Ben. Um, all right. Fantastic lecture. And uh, we'll see some of you guys next week for our next lecture.